Hi everyone and welcome back to the George Collection. I'm Rachel Wrightside Blonde. Today I'm going to be taking three different George magazines and tying these topics together. And this is something I've covered before in episode 79 and that was about the Nixon cover. Today I'd like to focus on the June-July 1996 issue of George with the article called Bob Woodward's Big Secret. In episode 79 I featured the Nixon cover and I showed the segment of Tucker Carlson back when he was still on Fox of him talking about Gerald Ford and how he ended up being president when he wasn't elected in. One thing you should know is that the most popular president in American history was Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon. Yet somehow, without a single vote being cast by a single American voter, Richard Nixon was kicked out of office and replaced by the only unelected president in American history. So we went from the most popular president to a president nobody voted for. Wasn't Richard Nixon a criminal? Wasn't he despised by all decent people? <laughs> no, he wasn't. Richard Nixon was re-elected in 1972 by the largest margin of the popular vote ever recorded before or since. Less than two years later, he was gone. He was forced to resign. And in his place, an obedient servant of the federal agencies called Gerald Ford took over the White House. How did that happen? Richard Nixon believed that elements in the federal bureaucracy were working to undermine the American system of government and had been doing that for a long time. On June 23, 1972, Nixon met with the then CIA director, Richard Helms, at the White House. During the conversation, which thankfully was tape recorded, Nixon suggested he knew, quote, who shot John, meaning President John F. Kennedy. Nixon further implied that the CIA was directly involved in Kennedy's assassination, which we now know it was. Helms' telling response, total silence. But for Nixon, it didn't matter because it was already over. Four days before, on June 19th, the Washington Post had published the first of many stories about a break-in at the Watergate office building. Unbeknownst to Nixon and unreported by the Washington Post, four of the five burglars worked for the CIA. The first of many dishonest Watergate stories was written by a 29-year-old Metro reporter called Bob Woodward. Who exactly was Bob Woodward? Well, he wasn't a journalist. Bob Woodward had no background whatsoever in the news business. Instead, Bob Woodward came directly from the classified areas of the federal government. Shortly before Watergate, Woodward was a naval officer at the Pentagon. He had a top secret clearance. He worked regularly with the intel agencies. At times, Woodward was even detailed to the Nixon White House, where he interacted with Richard Nixon's top aides. Soon after leaving the Navy, for reasons that have never been clear, Woodward was hired by the most powerful news outlet in Washington and assigned the biggest story in the country. And it's very interesting now, looking back through the George magazines, how Watergate and Bob Woodward are popping up in more than one magazine. As I mentioned last week in episode 98, on issue 17, there is a title called 25 Years Later, Weird Watergate Wonders. We obviously have covered the Nixon cover, and that was the first anniversary issue, so that's a big deal. And today I'm going to focus on this article called Bob Woodward's Big Secret. Let's see what his secret is. Off the record, Bob Woodward has a knack for turning politics into bestsellers. But does the truth get lost in translation? This is by Robert Sam Anson. Bob Woodward has a secret. You can tell from the glint in his eyes, the excited shimmer that bulges the pupils and makes his soft brown irises seem like saucers. When he gets that look, friends say it can only mean one thing. Bob knows something no one else does. He isn't saying what it is, of course. On this mild March night in Georgetown, three months from the publication of his eighth book and 45 minutes before he's expected for an A-list party at the house of his former editor, Ben Bradley, Woodward is only dispensing hints. Yet, he is finishing a manuscript on the presidential election. No, he isn't worried about the 3,000 other journalists covering the campaign. Yes, he's come up with an unusual approach. No, he won't reveal what it is. The idea is simple, is all he'll say of the race which Simon & Schuster will bring out this summer. You collect information and present it to people while they're interested, before they vote. He smiles at the remark. The other Teddy Whites will be presenting their chronicles of president-making long after the inauguration. Woodward will unveil his before the convention's bunting goes up. I'd like to answer that, Woodward says with the same smile in response to a query about a source. 
I wish I could take you upstairs and show you my files, he says at another moment, smiling again. I'd love to tell you this great line I got from Clinton, he says, still later, the smile, as beguiling as it is enigmatic, still in place. His visitor, who's known him a long while, smiles back. There will be no trip upstairs, no divulging of Clinton's great line, no answer to any question beyond exactly what Woodward wants to provide. He is a man of secrets, and he keeps them very well. Woodward looks at his watch. With deadline looming, he had not been keen on granting this interview. My life is very boring, he'd said, trying to beg off, and now that the 90 minutes he's allotted for it tick precisely to a close, he seems relieved. He calls out to his pregnant wife Elsa to come in and say hello and laments how caring for a sick dog had kept him up most of the previous night. Then, as if sensing his visitor's disappointment over not getting meatier scraps, relates an anecdote about Steve Forbes. He'd underestimated Forbes, Woodward admits, was way behind in realizing his was a serious bid. So I went to see him, he recounts, the day before the Iowa caucuses, in his hotel suite, Sunday afternoon. And I said, I've screwed up here. I didn't see this coming. He appreciated that, and we sat for three hours. The glint returns. What an interesting way, says the most famous reporter in America, to spend a day. Woodward's visitor thanks him for the color and heads into the night. A few blocks later, the moral of the story occurs. On the jam-packed eve of one of the most important events in his life, what does Steve Forbes do? He spends three precious hours talking to Bob Woodward. Who can blame him? Elections come and go, but Robert Woodward of the Washington Post changes history. Who else, after all, has brought down a president? Or stripped so bare the workings of the U.S. Supreme Court, the CIA, and the Joint Chiefs of Staff? In the annals of American journalism, only Walter Lippmann approaches his clout, and Lippmann never had Robert Redford play him in the movies. The superlatives that describe Woodward unfurl like a well-worn banner. Of course he's the best reporter Ben Bradley has ever seen. Of course, he cracks stories no one else cracks, does things no one else does, including sell nonfiction books in greater profusion than anyone since Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He is Bob Woodward, the name brand in investigative journalism as former Washington City paper editor Jack Schaefer puts it, like Kleenex. And for the generation that grew up with the Watergate saga, just as familiar. A close of the eyes brings it all back, the tape left on a lock at the headquarters of the Democratic National Committee, the call to police, then the entrance of the perfectly mismatched heroes to hunt down the evildoers, Carl Bernstein, the old shaggy screw-up, bursting with Jewish heat, Woodward, the button-down Brooks Brothers ad, embodying everything wasp. We know how the story turned out for all the president's men and for the young pair who defied the odds and undid them. Bernstein sucked down into a whirlpool of celebrity and sin. Woodward, ever steady, going on to still greater glory. The articles and TV shows, hundreds of them in the last 20 years, have made the survivor our John Glenn. Syndicated columnist Richard Reeves calls him almost a family member. As well as we know our Uncle Eli's temper, we know Bob's calm and low-key manner. Understand, like Cousin Betty's gabbiness, his refusal to reveal methods or disclose sources. When he humbles himself as just a processor of facts, we nod and nod again at the self-described plotter and humorless workaholic relating tales of getting up before dawn and going back to sources six, eight, and a dozen times. Just as we nod when someone such as political guru James Carville, a major helper in Woodward's unclothing of the Clinton White House, tells of what it is like to sit with him, thinking, by God, Bob Woodward is listening to me. Maybe I ought to tell him more. We know seemingly everything there is to know about Bob Woodward, except perhaps who he really is and how exactly he learns what no one else can. He is the most hooded man I know, says his friend, GQ writer Ted Gupp. Adds another old acquaintance, Washington Monthly editor Charlie Peters. He has a sincere belief in himself as Woodward. To continue to be the Woodward people think he is, he will go a long way. Talks with those who've glimpsed him through the years. More than 100 friends, co-workers, and critics all together confirm both impressions and sketch a Woodward who's constructed his legend as painstakingly as any of his investigations. There is great accomplishment in the figure who emerges, but smudges in the image too ruthlessness, duplicity, manipulativeness, and deceit, intolerance of criticism, betrayal of friends, and critics allege outright lying. It is a complicated story, the Woodward mystery, 
and the unraveling of it begins in Wheaton, Illinois, hometown of John Belushi and Billy Graham. Here, where you could unlock your door, leave your life savings on the dining room table, and know they'd still be there when you came back. As Woodward's schoolmate and later collaborator Scott Armstrong puts it, Bob grew up eldest of the three children of Alfred Woodward, the town's chief judge and leading symbol of its rectitude. Early on, though, Bob learned that placid appearances could conceal a patent place. When he was 12, his mother ran off with the husband of a couple who'd been the Woodward's closest friends. There was more trauma when the judge, who'd won custody of Bob and his siblings, remarried, adding three stepchildren to the Woodward household. After the expanded family's first Christmas, Bob confronted his father with a catalog, proving the new arrivals had gotten more expensive gifts than he had. Woodward would tell that story often in later years, citing it as evidence of his being an outsider, someone not only different from those around him, but nobler in his pursuits. I'm going to classical music concerts, or I'm up there in my room listening on ham radio to the world, Woodward says today, and everybody else is watching the latest sitcom on TV. His high school yearbook presents a brighter picture, recording Bob as a member of the track and football teams, a candidate for student body president, and a featured speaker at graduation where he delivered an approving appraisal of Barry Goldwater's The Conscience of a Conservative. He also appeared to have had no trouble attracting girls. Kathleen Middlecoff, one of the smartest and prettiest in the school, was his sweetheart, and in 1966 became the first of his three wives. Outsider, she laughs about her ex. How can you be an outsider and run for student body president? The split image, what Woodward portrays, what those close to him see, would continue throughout his life. It showed up at Yale, which he attended on an ROTC scholarship from the Navy, and where, or so he said in interviews after Watergate, he underwent a crisis over Vietnam. The anguish is predictable for an image-conscious post-war public figure. It comes as news, however, to those who remember Woodward as a rock-ribbed Nixon voter, troubled only by the inconvenience Vietnam would cause for his career. His final year in the Navy as a Pentagon-based communications liaison officer was studded with contradictions as well. Woodward first saying he was a White House basement regular, then saying he wasn't, even after his father, his wife, the chief of naval operations, and the secretary of defense all said he was. One thing about the pre-Watergate Bob Woodward is clear. The freshly discharged ex-lieutenant who signed up for a reporter's job at the Montgomery County Sentinel in 1970 was a most unusual young man. He'd always come back to the office and say things like, there's going to be a revolution down in such and such Banana Republic in about 10 days, says Robert Farquhar, who hired Woodward at the Suburban Maryland Weekly. And by God, there was. The Post, which Woodward joined after a year apprenticing with the Sentinel, was also aware of his channel to the upper reaches. Quote, Bob's friend, editors at the Metro section called Woodward Source, or more simply, Mr. X. With Watergate, the mysterious figure who imparted so much took on a new identity. Now he was, quote, deep throat. Who he was, Woodward has never revealed. His editors didn't know, and as the scandal unfolded, some were skeptical he really existed, believing throat a composite of several sources. Woodward's main source for his Watergate series was the deputy director of the FBI, Mark Felt. And Mark Felt ran, and we're not making this up, the FBI's COINTELPRO program, which was designed to secretly discredit political actors the federal agencies wanted to destroy, people like Richard Nixon. With the publication of All the President's Men in 1974, the doubt spread not only about a one-man throat, but about Woodward's suspiciously John Le Carre-like accounts of their late night parking garage meetings, following signals passed by Woodward's moving a flower pot on his apartment balcony. All the president's men did have troubles, beginning with who was going to write it. Originally, city editor Barry Sussman, Woodward and Bernstein's most dogged champion during Watergate was to have partnered in the project, but he was cut out following a dispute over how to split the $55,000 advance. There were also difficulties about what approach to take, a dilemma resolved when Robert Redford, who'd purchased the movie rights pre-publication, advised Woodward, just write the story as you lived it. Deep Throat proved tricky to handle as well. In the original manuscript, he was scarcely mentioned. By the time the presses were ready to roll, he'd become a major character, and a major reason all the president's men went on to huge sales and generally rapturous reviews. The applause was not unanimous. Examining the plethora of who ate what for breakfast details that helped make the book such a convincing read, biographer Adrian Havel, 
found more than a few demonstrably false and others, including the gyrations of Woodward's famous flower pot, unlikely in the extreme. Woodward's reaction was anything but the coolness of legend. Alerted that Deep Truth was on the verge of publication, Woodward phoned up editor Bruce Shostak of Birch Lane Press to complain about the ethics of bringing out a biography with which he'd refused to cooperate. When that failed to move Shostak, who remembers the call as having the nature of an inquisition, Woodward publicly blasted Deep Truth as pathetic and empty. He had light contempt for Watergate histories that diverged from his own, pronouncing Len Colidney and Robert Getlin's silent coup truly and utterly a piece of garbage, and Jim Hoogan's secret agenda a turd in the soup. When his image was at stake, even minor incidents could set Woodward off. So journalist and author Kitty Kelly learned when, during the Nixon impeachment hearings, she stumbled across Woodward's having signed up himself and his then-girlfriend, Texas reporter Francie Bernard, for a local health club's married discount. Securing a copy of the contract, Kelly brought the story to Washington editor Jack Limpert, who, says Kelly, authorized a lighthearted piece titled The $150 Misunderstanding. Kelly quickly got cheerful confirmation from Bernard, then called Woodward. How dare you do a story like this? Kelly remembers him saying, Who are you to be questioning me? Then, after accusing Kelly of having an affair with the health club's owner, Woodward hung up. Not long afterward, says Kelly, the Post attorney famed trial lawyer Edward Bennett Williams phoned the Washingtonian. That, says Kelly, was the end of the $150 misunderstanding story. Asked about the incident, Woodward says Bernard, not he, signed the contract and that during the time in question, he was not even speaking to Ed Williams. The weariness about Woodward intensified with the 1976 publication of The Final Days. John Osborne, the New Republic's respected White House watcher, pronounced the unsourced rendition of Nixon's Gotterdammerung on the whole the worst job of nationally known reporting that I've observed in 49 years in the business. A stung Woodward told U.S. News and World Report, we double-checked everything. If we could not get two sources on something, we left it out. No rumor or gossip was used. Nobody has disputed any fact. Diane Sawyer, who'd been a press aide in the Nixon White House, was one of many unconvinced. Neither she nor her boss, Ron Ziegler, had talked to the reporters. Yet there they were in the final days, quoted verbatim during a meeting at which no one else had been present. They managed to describe a scene which never took place, Sawyer told Nixon biographer Victor Lasky. I'm curious about their sources. Woodward, meanwhile, was going through some changes. Now he was married and owned a place. There were also alterations to his professional life. For one, he was no longer working with Bernstein. By 1979, he had another collaborator, Old Wheaton and Yale alum Scott Armstrong, and, in The Brethren, another bestseller. Their account of backbiting and buffoonery on the hitherto impenetrable Supreme Court loosed a storm of publicity and a fresh round of barbs at Woodward. Some of the most pointed came from New Yorker writer Renata Alder, whose scathing review in the New York Times took dead aim at Woodward's refusal to identify sources. It makes stories almost impossible to verify, wrote Adler. It suppresses a major element of every investigative story. Who wanted it known? In response, Woodward denounced Adler, a Yale Law graduate, as ignorant and infantile and blamed her for the fact that he'd received only $880,000 for the paperback rights. Midst the contretemps and a bitter divorce from Bernard in 1979, Woodward's post-career was progressing rapidly. In 1979, he was named assistant managing editor for Metropolitan News and was widely counted as a leading contender to succeed Bradley. The keys to being a great reporter, Woodward told his staff, were three. You have to have a compulsive need to succeed, you have to be insecure, and you have to want desperately to please your boss. One reporter did admirably on all counts. Her name was Janet Cook. Like nearly everyone who encountered her, Woodward was dazzled by the 26-year-old African-American beauty. Her brains, her glittering resume, along with her ability to speak five languages, she claimed a magna cum laude degree from Vassar and graduate studies at the Sobern. The story goes on to say that Janet Cook's story was fake and her resume was fake as well. And so Bob Woodward was left dealing with that. Woodward admitted he should not have been so hasty in shunting aside staff doubts about this Janet Cook. Still, he said, it is a brilliant story, fake and fraud that it is. Afterward, Post publisher Don Graham advised Woodward to abandon thoughts of succeeding Bradley. 
Woodward took the hint and, with a change of title to Assistant Managing Editor for Investigations, soon plunged into what would become Wired, the short life and fast times of John Belushi. The relentless chronicle of the popular comedian's drug-fueled self-destruction was, per usual, a bestseller. Also per usual, Wired engendered headline-making controversy, as Belushi's friends, such as Jack Nicholson and Dan Aykroyd, lined up to lambast it. The complaints were not about Woodward's accuracy, but his focus on drugs and, even more, his alleged misleading of sources. Most fervent claiming betrayal was Belushi's widow, Judy, who convinced Woodward to take up the project in the belief his articles would clear up the circumstances of her husband's death. Woodward, she said, gives you that trust me, trust me feeling, the yes, I understand type of thing. He seems so honest. He would say over and over, John was a wonderful man. We must tell his story. Believing a warm portrait was in store, Judy, who talked to Woodward 21 times and turned over her personal diaries as well, kept opening celebrity doors for him. I was like a Pavlonian dog, she said. I was calling him up whenever anyone said anything weird about him or John or the story, and he would reassure me. He'd kind of laugh and say, it's like the game telephone. When you hear something that bothers you, you should call me. She also told of being unaware that two months after beginning work on his articles, Woodward signed a $600,000 book contract with Simon & Schuster. I believed his image totally, she said ruefully. You know, Watergate and Robert Redford? I never knew what Bob Woodward was really like. When the uproar was at its height, Rolling Stone assigned 24-year-old Lynn Hirschberg to sort out the competing claims. Hirschberg thought it a dream job. He was my white knight, she says of Woodward, the equivalent of God. Woodward did nothing to disabuse her, opening up his files, sharing sexual secrets from adolescence, even inquiring if a repairman had shown up to fix the broken refrigerator she groused about. Thinking Woodward had gone from story subject to flirting friend, Hirschberg began confiding in him, revealing that Rolling Stone, in her words, was rewriting the quotes she'd gather from Judy Belushi and her opinion that Rolling Stone's editor was an asshole. Unbeknownst to Hirschberg, Woodward was writing it all down. Also unknown to Hirschberg, he'd secured a copy of her original manuscript from a similarly enthralled Rolling Stone researcher. When Hirschberg's cover story appeared, Woodward forwarded the less critical first draft to gossip columnist Liz Smith, who bannered the differences two days running. He also dispatched a six-page letter to Rolling Stone, laying out Hirschberg's most inflammatory quotes. I can't believe you were taking notes of our conversations, a furious Hirschberg said to Woodward afterward replied Woodward, weren't you? Hirschberg should not have been surprised. During her own reporting, Woodward had told her that compassion ranked low on the list of journalistic attributes, number 10 among 10. As Judy Belushi had discovered, he could also be subtly manipulative pursuing a scoop. I'll play with her kid, he once told Post reporters. On arrival, according to the Washingtonian, Woodward did play with the kid, and the mother, charmed, opened up just as he'd predicted. Other reporters employed the same techniques. What set Woodward apart was the lengths to which he'd go. The hardball extended to the post, where Woodward's imperious style helped bring on the resignations of investigative stars such as Morton Mintz and Ron Kessler, who'd had Woodward be best man at his wedding. Another bright light departed after Woodward divulged his supposedly confidential intra-office assessments to post superiors. Being a drone, however, was no guarantee of protection. The staff as a whole became suspect after Woodward announced during a promotional appearance for Wired on CBS Morning News that probably 40 of his office mates were regular cocaine users. Following outrage from Bradley, Woodward backed off, claiming the CBS interviewer Diane Sawyer had set him up. When the film version of Wired debuted, Woodward, who'd been a technical advisor on the production, hailed it to the press as terrific, exceptional, much better than the book. After the movie proved a box office bomb, he shifted tack, telling Esquire that Wired was awful, terrible. Few challenged Woodward directly, however. You cannot criticize him, says Joe Layton, who worked at the Post. As far as the Post is concerned, he walks on holy ground. The paper, though, was seeing less and less of Woodward, whose time was increasingly taken up with books. Vail, his account of William Casey's management of the CIA, appeared in 1987 and produced a sensation, not so much over Woodward's disclosures, which were startling and many, as over his assertion that he'd visited the CIA director in his hospital room following Casey's surgery for a cancerous brain tumor. During the five-minute encounter, Woodward reported, 
The failing spy master uttered a total of 19 words, including, I believed, which along with a grunt, a nod, and a half smile, Woodward took as confirmation of Casey's knowledge of Iran Contra. More cautious, the Post buried the supposed meeting in paragraph 17 of its Vail report. It's a profoundly ambiguous scene, Assistant Managing Editor for National Affairs Robert Kaiser explained to Newsday. It isn't what a newspaper would regard as confirmation of an extremely sensitive story. Some doubted that the meeting had even occurred. How, they wondered, had Woodward managed to get into Casey's hospital room when it was being watched over not only by hospital and CIA security, but also by Casey's daughter and wife? Woodward offered four different explanations. Assuming one of the versions was correct, why, critics asked, was his rendition of the visit so devoid of the usual chock-a-block of details? Even more puzzling was how Woodward conversed with Casey. His wife of 50 years, Sophia, said he could speak only in labored monosyllables and that most of their communication was through gestures. Her assessment was seconded by Casey's secretary, who said her boss could no more communicate than the man on the moon. Casey's doctor, I never heard him make a coherent verbal response, and several undisputed visitors, including George Bush. Woodward, nonetheless, continued to insist the visit had taken place. If I hadn't gone to see him, he told Esquire, it would have been almost rude. Casey was in no position to argue. By the time Vail appeared, he'd been dead five months. Also succumbing quickly was the arms and elbows investigating that had formerly distinguished the post. Now and again, Woodward would authorize corruption and malfeasance staples, but more and more he favored long-in-the-making explanations of how government worked. The kinder, gentler attitude was reflected in The Commanders, a pro-military 1991 bestseller that lauded the pre-Gulf War caution of Joint Chiefs Chairman Colin Powell, who cooperated with Woodward, and castigated the instinctive hawkishness of Commander-in-Chief George Bush, who did not. Woodward was a friend, Powell later testified to Congress, admitting he'd talked to him often during 1989 and 1990. As for the commanders, that, said Powell, should be read for what it is, a combination of fact, of fiction, of accurate quotations, and in some cases, not so accurate quotations. He had malleable rules about divulging the identity of confidential sources. One instance involved an FBI agent who'd been providing deep background information during Watergate. Woodward and Bernstein honored the agreement until the agent refused to confirm a discredited story of theirs concerning secret grand jury testimony. At that point, Woodward and Bernstein threatened to reveal the agent's previous cooperation to his superior. When the, quote, sweating, trembling, panicked agent still refused to budge, Woodward and Bernstein made good on their pledge. They knew instinctively they were wrong. The FBI agent wasn't the last Woodward source to be burned. During a 1989 Playboy interview, Woodward revealed that it was Supreme Court Justice Potter Stewart pouring out bile about Warren Burger while stumbling around drinking mint juleps, who'd given him the inspiration for the Brethren and been a principal source during his reporting. Woodward's rationale for the disclosure? Stewart was recently deceased. H. Ross Perot was very much alive, however, when in 1992 Woodward quoted off-the-record remarks Perot had made four years earlier. Woodward's explanation? Perot had become a presidential candidate. There were other shattered trusts, none, though, quite like the case of Richard Darman. For 20 years, the Office of Management and Budget Director in the Bush administration had been one of Woodward's closest friends, and not once was a confidence violated. Then, in late 1991, Woodward told Darman he was thinking of writing a book about Bush's economic policy. The volume, Woodward added, wouldn't appear until after the 1992 presidential election, with two stipulations, that the information be used only for the book, and be off the record unless he cleared it following the election. Darman agreed to help. In the months that followed, he provided a ringside view of various policy fights, as well as a guide to the important players. Without informing Darman, Woodward, meanwhile, was going to the players to get confirmation of what he'd been told. Assuming Darman was cooperating, they did as well, providing Woodward with a wealth of details about Darman's thinking, including his view that Treasury Secretary Nicholas Brady was adult. Then, two weeks before the presidential election, Woodward called Darman himself. The book was off, he said. Instead, he was using the information he'd collected for an about-to-be-published post-series. When Darman reminded him of their agreement, Woodward says he told him, The election is an important event for you, not for me. The morning the first installment hit the streets, reporters were camped out on Darman's lawn, waiting to see if he'd resigned. Darman kept his job, but his friendship with Woodward terminated. 
Woodward expresses no regrets. When you do your job, he says, you pay the price. The Clinton White House paid it for deciding to cooperate with Woodward during his reporting of the new administration's economic policy disputes. The result was the agenda, which opened with the soon-to-be first couple in bed in Arkansas. Said she to he, I think if you run, you win. And so you better be really careful about wanting to do this and making these changes in your life. How Woodward came by this tidbit and the dozen lines of dialogue that accompanied it, all quoted word for word as if he'd been under the covers taking notes, he wouldn't reveal. His other disclosures, though, were easy to track. With approval from the highest level, the White House staff fairly fell over themselves in the stampede to talk. It was amazing, says writer Richard Reeves, who was doing his own White House interviews at the time. They were treating him as if he were a national institution, and it was their patriotic duty to tell him everything. People were calling their mothers and saying, you'll never guess who I was talking to today. A few resisted, but Woodward made it difficult. You'll talk to me, he said to Clinton political consultant Mandy Grunwald, who'd been ducking his calls when he ran into her at a party. Grunwald asked why he was so sure. Because, said Woodward, you have speaking parts in the book. Grunwald did talk and said more than she had planned. He has a fascinating technique, she told friends. He starts off by describing a meeting where he knows 80% of what went on. You think, it does sound like a meeting I was at, but wait a second, he doesn't have the context right. So you end up telling him the 20% he doesn't know. His next question is about a meeting where he has 60% of the information and the next 40%. And you're always helping him fill in the blanks. By the time you're finished, you are telling him about things he didn't even know existed. There's a pretense of absolute omniscience, said author and journalist James Fallows, who'd once been close to Woodward. A God's eye view of what at best can only be one side of the story. Like others, Fallows was also dismayed by the protection racket journalism that compelled sources to cooperate, knowing that if they didn't talk to this most powerful of court historians, their enemies probably would. But what most troubled Fallows, and many who'd watched Woodward rise, was his arrogance. There was no shading in Bob Woodward's writing, no maybes, doubts, or qualifications. He explained nothing, was accountable to no one. His readers, he said, could distinguish between chicken shit and chicken salad. Woodward greeted the hubbub calmly. With his 1989 marriage to Post reporter Elsa Walsh, his life, he said, was more balanced. He relaxed more, found more time to socialize with the Georgetown set, tell glamour magazines about his new weekend place outside Annapolis, make lucrative appearances before such formally scorned groups as the Interstate Natural Gas Producers Association. He also wasn't quite so hair-triggered in the face of criticism from what he called the permanent grand jury of the Columbia Journalism Review. I don't get a kick out of protecting sources or keeping names out of books and newspapers, but those are the terms of engagement, particularly when you're involved with the intelligence agencies or the Nixon White House or the Supreme Court. In those worlds, there is no way people are going to talk on the record, he said. To those who continue to doubt him, he points to the fact that books like The Brethren are now a primary resource for scholars, that the memoirs of both Kissinger and Nixon have confirmed some of his most controversial reporting in the final days, that Secretary of Defense Richard Cheney thought so much of the commanders he sent a copy home for Mother's Day. Yes, he is saddened by the unhappiness of the Judy Belushi's, but he says, you've got to get close probably closer in your questioning than they've ever got to themselves. It's about developing trust, Woodward explains, about getting somebody so they will tell you too much. And once the trust is established, it is the duty of someone like himself to unblinkingly publish the results. He could, Woodward says, look any of his sources in the eye and say, it may be closer to the skin than you like it, but it is all justified, it is all true. The same standard, Woodward says, should apply to judging his words. It's about the quality of information, as he phrases it. Is it true? Has it been checked? In the end, that's all that matters. When has the fucking New York Times printed detailed, concrete, authoritative criticism of a sitting president? There was a limit, though, to Woodward's ease. As the mid-1990s approached, he was 53, an age when, he noted, rivals like Seymour Hersh and David Halberstam had either burnt out or gone on to less exacting pursuits. That, he vowed, was not going to happen to him. My reaction to middle age, he said, is F you. All he needed was a topic to engage him. Finally, during a visit to the Hamptons in late summer 1994, his Simon & Schuster editor, Alice Mayhem, 
supplied one. The race for the 1996 Republican presidential nomination. Woodward, who'd never covered campaign politics before, leapt at it, much to the consternation of Post editor Len Downey, who'd already mapped out the Post's campaign coverage. Trying to dissuade him, Downey says, he told Woodward he didn't see him as a political reporter, didn't think him nuanced enough to grasp an election's intricacies. Woodward, though, was determined, and before long the men who would be president were opening themselves up to him. How could they not? Having Bob Woodward ride in the back of his pickup truck one day, Lamar Alexander told Associates, was proof of being serious. What emerged during that trip were the six sessions Woodward had with Phil and Wendy Graham, or the three hours with Steve Forbes, or the scores of other conversations whispered into Woodward's ear, Downey will learn only when final galleys for the race land on his desk. All the executive editor of the Washington Post knows at present is that every day his most valuable reporter adds another 10 pages to the manuscript. Every night he locks it in a safe. One day though, the magic of the shy, quiet boy who used to ask friends in Wheaton, tell me your most embarrassing secret will be revealed. He has donated his papers and the mysteries they contain to Yale. They are to be opened in 40 years. Bob Woodward hasn't gone anywhere. In the year 2022, he released a book called The Trump Tapes that feature 20 conversations he had with Donald Trump. When I have information that I had from people who are doctors, people who are not partisan, people who want to address this national crisis, I am going and I have access to the President of the United States and I'm going to say, this is what I'm learning. What are you doing? And the answer is, and this is the tragedy, this is the sickness for the country, that he, he says, oh, as I said, there's light at the end of the tunnel. It's going to go away. And anyone who knows anything about this knows it's not going away. Perhaps I held back too much. I did this with Trump. When I did the tapes book and examined exactly what he did and his performance and the denial of his responsibility as president, I felt uh, that I had been too soft. Mm. He was not just the man, the wrong man for the job. He was uh, unfit to be president, that he did not understand the presidency and its responsibilities to every citizen, uh, and that he didn't understand democracy. My question, and what I feel every American's question for Bob Woodward should be, Bob, given your extensive experience in dealing with spying and fraud, why would you release the Trump tapes in 2022 when we had a perfect opportunity for you to look into the Russian collusion hoax and the spying on Donald Trump's campaign? It's an honest question. Why would you focus on these tapes that you have with Donald Trump almost like you're trying to get him, when there's perfectly legitimate corruption right in your wheelhouse that you could have exposed. It just makes us all wonder. I think George Magazine was a great conduit to information. This issue that we went through today, talking about Bob Woodward's big secret, the first anniversary issue with Richard Nixon on the cover, and the 17th issue with George Clooney on the cover that talks about Watergate wonders, I think are all pointing to something that we need to look into a little deeper. Who is Bob Woodward? Where did he get his information? Is it true information? Who does he really work for? And what are we going to do about it? That does it for this episode of The George Collection. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you all have a great week, and I'll see you next time. which is a hoot of a magazine. I thought you were a lawyer. I was. What happened? Well, we, uh, we decided, I mean, 
actually taking a cue from from folks like yourself and you around the 1992 election that that there was an opportunity here to uh, change the definition of a political magazine uh, certainly the way Americans were uh, accessing information about politics and politicians was changing uh, candidates were appearing on late-night talk shows on talk radio on sitcoms uh, and there was a, a kind of a leveling process and while the rest of media clearly had caught up with that, we felt that political magazines, per se, hadn't. Your mother was a hell of an editor at Doubleday. That's what I hear. Would she have liked George? I think she would have.